Sony's machines. So to the analysis. So the very first, it's very important when you're doing malware analysis to be uh, pretty methodical when you're analyzing the malware. And part of that is doing some bookkeeping in the beginning. So like collecting hashes, um, what, what, what are the names of the malware samples and that sort of thing. Um, and also another really important thing is to run it against like some existing antivirus. See if this is like an already known malware sample or it's something completely new dropped on a honeypot or something, right? Um, so the malware analysis that you'll, I mean, the, the malware sample you'll find in the, uh, like, the reports by the FBI and stuff, it has this hash here. Um, uh, this is the results from VirusTotal. Uh, it's, it basically, you upload your malware sample to VirusTotal and it'll run it against a whole bunch of antiviruses. Um, there's also an option for people to say, oh, is this a good malware sample? Is this actually a real good piece of software or is it actually a piece of malware? So 32 people said this is a bad piece of software, and four people are probably going to have a very bad day. <laughs> 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 um, the malware sample is actually um, a different variant that I analyzed. Uh, it actually has this hash, and I found it on VirusShare. Um, you can definitely still find the malware sample that has this hash, but this is the first one I came across. Um, and p three people said it was bad. So I guess this is the wall of shame, in a way. Uh, these are the these are the um, antivirus that said uh, this wasn't a malware sample. So, if you go back a slide, said 47 out of 57 antivirus said that this was a bad, evil malware sample, right? Uh, these are the ten that said it was fine, um, which is a little surprising because you know you recognize some of these names. Um, maybe it just because the, the the time it got uploaded and analyzed, but it was pretty recent, um, like three weeks and three days since when I made this slide. So. Uh, also, when you're running uh, a malware sample, you usually don't want to do it just like on your regular computer because that's bad. You don't want to run. You don't want to infect your own machine with malware, right? So you normally run it inside like a virtual environment. So I use VMware Workstation 11. Uh, it's pretty effective. So the nice thing about running malware samples and stuff inside of virtual environments like VMware is you can also set up like virtual networks and stuff. So you can monitor um, like the network traffic, uh, do packet captures and stuff with Wireshark. So. VMware is very, very useful for that. So, right, so I guess after uploading it to VirusTotal, one thing I like to do is just kind of like, well, right click uh, the executable and run it as an administrator to see if there's something <laughs> obvious in, inside the virtual environment, right? <laughs> just to see what it does. Uh, so when I right clicked and ran this malware sample as an administrator, um, it wasn't, uh, it's a little anticlimactic. Uh, it just produced another executable on the desktop. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a little disappointing. For, for a malware sample called white ball, which is supposed to like, destroy like, the, right, the virtual environment, uh, it just made another executable. So a little bit of a letdown there, right? We need to do more. So another thing you can do, um, I guess this kind of falls more in the bookkeeping, is instead of just running it and, as an administrator and seeing what happens, let's stick it into an environment that has a bunch of monitoring tools on it and see what it does inside of like a sandbox. Uh, so a sandbox will produce kind of like a general kind of malware overview report that you can kind of look at. Um, so I uploaded the sample to malware.com, M-A-L-W-R.com, um, and it runs it inside the sandbox called Cuckoo. Uh, so it di didn't exactly do what I was expecting it to. Um, it said it didn't contact any host, it didn't contact any domains, which is a little suspicious. Um, there's some useful information, like that it might contain some encrypted or compressed data. That's useful information, and it has been identified by at least one antivirus on anti uh, on virus total. So, and it only produces some ICMP traffic, which hmm. it says no drop files. So what's going on? We have we 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 clicked it ourselves. It dropped this IGFX whatever binary. So even the sandbox didn't pick up on that, which I thought was a little weird. Um, yeah, so yeah, we see it. The, the IGFX trade ex.exe. So, uh, sandboxes aren't always 100% reliable. Um, so, doing a malware, like doing, actually having a malware analyst look at a uh, malware sample is, you get a lot more information out of it that way. So, one tool that's really useful when doing malware analysis is this tool called CFF Explorer. If you're not familiar with it, it's a really great way to get some general information about the binary you're analyzing. Um, you can also like flip a few bits um, to just like 
change some things that make analysis a little easier. And this actually came in really handy. How many of you here, raise by a show of hands, how many of you have done a CTF before? Or CTF challenges? All right, yeah, a good number of you. So a really, really popular uh, CTF is Ghost in the Shell Code. It's a lot, a lot of fun. You, you essentially get to hack a video game. And you can give yourself like super speed, uh, super jump, and you try to solve all these challenges that are um, hacking related. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, one of the things that we did, like one of the things you can do, for example, is disable the randomization address of like a DLL, and all the game logic in the CTF was like uh, kept inside of a DLL. So when you're moving it from like Ida or whatever into Ollie, it can be useful to, like disable that randomization, right? So the way I used it for the Sony malware sample uh, was kind of get a general overview. See, uh, you get the hashes, you can tell some more information about the executable. Uh, like, for example, it's, it was compiled using Microsoft Visual C++ compiler, right? That's pretty useful. Um, another a little suspicious thing there, right? We see that the portable executable size was 56 kilobytes, and then the file size was 430.38 kilobytes. So not all of this was uh, part of the executable. And the microphone is falling. There we go. Um, so yeah, if you compare this to something like Putty, which is just like an SSH client, you see like the file size was 472 kilobytes and the portable executable size was 472 kilobytes. So something might be a little bit off there, right? Uh, another really useful tool is called PEView. Um, this actually gives some pretty significant information, like when exactly was this malware sample compiled? And this date here, circled in green, is a little suspicious, right? It's November 22nd, 2014. Uh, this tax on Sony Entertainment happened the 23rd or 24th, right? Yeah. So, hmm, interesting. All right, so another thing you have to ask yourself when analyzing a malware sample is, is this malware sample packed? Uh, if a malware sample is packed, it makes it significantly more difficult to reverse engineer. Um, there are legitimate reasons to pack a program. Uh, so, like, maybe you want to use, implement that as kind of a form of DRM, make your program harder to maybe crack. And also, the main purpose of packing a program is to make its executable size smaller. Um, yeah, just to reduce the size of your executable in general. Uh, what happens during a pack, when the malware sample is packed, is it, it basically decompresses and becomes larger in memory. <coughs> so why would a malware analyst actually want to pack a program? Well, you can obfuscate a lot of strings. Um, and once again, it makes it harder for someone who's like looking at your malware sample to reverse engineer. Because having people reverse engineer your malware sample is bad. So yeah, just asking the question, is this malware sample packed? And pretty much the answer was no. <laughs> uh, PEID -E is a great tool for kind of identifying whether or not this, whether or not a um, malware sample is packed. This one wasn't. And you can also look at some of the histograms, which give you an overview of entropy. Uh, the text segment of the executable didn't really indicate that it was packed. But you also have the rest of the program, which was weird because that wasn't part of a segment. And it was pretty high in entropy. So this file, as you'll find out, this malware sample, it kind of drops other executables. And it, it's kind of modular and runs in components. Right, so back to CFF Explorer. You see here, uh, one of the things you can do to tell if a malware sample is packed is if the virtual size um, of the executable is much better, is much larger than the raw size. Um, so when we say uh, the raw size, it's like the actual size in the file, and virtual size is like the size in memory. Um, so yeah. All right, so you can only get so far with just uh, like basic tools that give you a general <coughs> overview of like the static analysis of a program. Um, so one of the things you'll have to do is kind of do some code analysis. So when we say code analysis, it's actually kind of looking at the assembly language, like looking at the assembly of um, the malware sample. So unfortunately, malware authors aren't real keen on giving you, um, uh, giving you the source code to their programs, right? Yeah, they, they probably don't want to give you that. Uh, so uh, how do you get static analysis? You take IDACATs and you build them up against malware balloons. Uh, so my general idea here is that you get static electricity, but as I found out from my vice president Daniel, normal people don't rub balloons up against cats. <laughs> uh, I, I don't advise it. You could use any kind of fur to get static electricity. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the tool I used to do static analysis on this binary is called uh, IDA. I used IDA free. It pretty much suits the purposes of what you kind of need to analyze it. Um, IDA Pro obviously has a lot of really, really useful features. Um, for example, hex raise decompiler can kind of give you almost like the source code of program, but IDA, just the free version of um, IDA disassembler, you're pretty much just going to get assembly language, and you have to kind of look at that. Um, so yeah, as I talked about before, um, this malware sample drops different components. So just looking at our original executable, which had that long hash, which I kind of named destover.exe, it dropped that you can't really get a full analysis of the malware sample without also looking at the smaller components like igfxtray.exe, executable loss. So you have to look at both things. They do different stuff. Um, yeah, so the idea here is it's modular design. So yeah, uh, one of the things that the malware sample does, if you look at some of the um, assembly, is that it installs itself as a service. So one of the reasons why malware might want to install itself as a service is to become persistent. So like you say, hey, maybe the computer reboots and you want it to keep running? Uh, you want your malware sample to keep running? Well, yeah, it's install it as a service. And you can also hide from the process list by installing as a service too. So that's pretty useful. So just an overview, kind of like, so we all kind of understand like what this assembly kind of looks like and how it works is, say you have this function called fluffy and it has a parameter called sheep. <laughs> well, uh, this is like an overview of a picture of what the stack looks like. So the first thing you do is kind of push the parameters of the function onto the stack. Uh, then you push the return address um, after you exit the function. Then you save your old base pointer and then you uh, move uh, you, the, you move ESP and the EBP to create like a new stack frame. But um, the most important thing here to take away is that you push the parameters of the function onto the stack first before you call the function. Right. So taking a look at this, we see that we have the function create service A that the malware sample uses, and all these things above it that are like pushes. Those are the parameters to the function. So we see some interesting things. For example, now we know what the name of the service that this that the malware sample installed. So it calls itself Win Schedule Management Service. Um, we also see some interesting um, uh, some interesting variables too. Um, we see that service it gives it the service auto start flag there, right? Um, it also XORs some other flags too. Uh, and also, this this is a little uh, kind of an annoying thing about IDA is uh, you have to actually like right click on these numbers and like select um, which what, what the name of it is. Um, normally, you'll just get kind of like a number there. Um, uh, yeah, all debug is a little bit better about like predicting what the name of these um, these variables are. Uh, another thing is when it's running commands in general, the malware sample actually creates a service real quick. It calls whatever it needs to do, and then it deletes the service shortly after. So it does this to just kind of hide itself um, inside of the, hide itself from the process list and stuff. So I thought that was pretty interesting. All right, so this malware sample is actually a network worm, <laughs> which if you're a system administrator, it probably looks a little more like this. <laughs> Something a little more like uh, Doom rather than uh, Shelby from Adventure Time. <laughs> um, so yeah, so how does, it, how does this worm work? Um, it actually uses a pretty primitive uh, method of propagating across the network. It actually uses uh, Windows file sharing, right? Uh, that's a pretty old, pretty old attack, right? Yeah, uh, it creates shares, um, but I guess the most significant of these is um, actually copying the binary onto the new machine, right? So you see here, uh, before we call this function sub402670, uh, we get the username uh, username and the password, and then we pass that to uh, WMIC. Yeah. <laughs> but what about IGFX tray? And I just love sheep, so that picture doesn't have much to do with the presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, one of the things IGFX tray is um, well, when we ran that executable before, uh, all it did was kind of just drop that IGFX tray, and then it kind of just sat there, right? And the reason why it was just sitting there was because there was extremely long delays between when the malware sample was kind of executed, like started going into its next stages. 
So if you kind of, in, in um, Ollie Debug, you can look at all like the sleep command. You can see all the references to the Windows sleep command. Uh, you see here that sometimes it's sleeping for like 300,000 milliseconds, and that's a pretty long time. So when you kind of like stick it inside of like a sandbox or whatever, um, the, the sandbox is because it's going to run for a certain amount of time, but it's not going to run forever inside that environment. Um, and maybe the malware didn't do anything interesting until it, this clock finally counted down. So one of the things you can do is you can patch the binary and actually change some of these weights to like much smaller times. So what I did was I uh, plugged in 200,000, uh, like two, I mean 2,000 milliseconds, uh, and replaced some of these very large values, which were like 300,000 milliseconds. That shortens it to like two seconds and stuff. So a much shorter time. And what you find, what it does is it, interestingly enough, we're in a worse situation now, uh, IGFX tray, what it does is it creates three copies of itself and places it on the desktop. So now not only do we have one IGFX tray we have to look at, we have three IGFX trays we have to look at. So exciting. Uh, fortunately, um, these IGFX trays all have the same hash. So you really only have to look at one of them. Yeah. Uh, but what you will find is that each of these IGFX tray executables um, they get started from like using the CMD command, but they all get started with a different flag. Uh, yeah. So this is what my desktop looked like before uh, I ran the malware sample, this new patch malware sample. And then this is what it looked like afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stuff started getting deleted, yeah. Um, even the desktop background um, started to disappear. And if you run this inside of Windows XP, I guess the background gets rendered a little differently. Uh, yeah, it seriously looks like something from the movie Hackers. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's pretty cheesy. Um, yeah, and you see, you see this uh, hacked by pound GOP. So uh, as it turns out, it doesn't stand for like the Republican Party. It stands for Guardians of Peace, <laughs> uh, which, uh, yeah, which would be the, uh, the North Koreans. So doing some network forensics of this executable as it goes through its different stages is uh, really helpful to get an idea of like what kind of host does this malware contact, uh, what kind of ways does it use to kind of propagate. So uh, c who can guess what this is? Yeah, it's a wire shit. <laughs> <laughs> so a really useful tool for taking a look at um, uh, looking a look at like packet hashes is Wireshark. You get a great overview of what the um, network data looks like. So this is the original Dustover.exe. Um, as you can see, it makes lots and lots of connections to port 445 and 139. Like, your know, logs just get filled up. It's really, really crazy loud and noisy, actually. Um, so this, these, these services are uh, NetBIOS and SMB. So, because we have a, we have a, we have a worm here that spreads using Windows file sharing. Um, yeah, so the, the IP addresses that it tries to contact and stuff, you can, they're in plain text. It's really, really easy to see. Like, just running strings on the binary, so like, just like, uh, forensics, like 101, run strings on your binary. Um, these are all just plain text, very easy to find, hard-coded IP addresses. And as you find, um, that each time for an IGF X-ray, it tries to call home a few times on port 8080. Um, and it does that to each of those IP addresses, which was statically coded. Um, and it does that to each IP address three times. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, uh, unfortunately, these were just kind of requests. I don't have the other end of the, the, the capture. Um, but, yeah. So final thoughts. Um, this malware sample wasn't really anything that complicated. Um, especially for something that was like written by like I guess like a government or something. It was, it was a little surprising that it was this easy. Uh, normally, like if you like take a look at like something like Stuxnet, which is thousands of line of code and super complicated, this was really, really, really simple to analyze. And I guess the next thing is, yeah, the news will be the news. Um, this got like a huge amount of hype, and when you try to look for information about the malware sample, you'll see like people describing this as like a super complex thing that's scary and wiping things. But when you look at it, it actually works uh, pretty simple. Uh, it's pretty, it operates um, in a really simple way. Um, yeah, someone like with a freshman 
but probably like a freshman who has like computer programming one experience probably could have written something similar. All right, so I, I guess uh, that's most of my slides, and I'll kind of open it up to questions. And there's my contact information. So, yeah, anyone have any questions for me? Or, yeah. So you programming on the code. What would be your recommendation for the one thing you saw that company has done? One thing. What should have done? Hmm. Hmm. One thing. Well. Yeah, or two. Sure. Oh. Hmm. Well, I, I guess there's. Th hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. I guess. Well, looking for like some suspicious, maybe in running an intrusion detection system, um, I, I would imagine there's rules you can pick up that would kind of detect when like a single machine or whatever is producing that many connections. On uh, using Windows file sharing and stuff, so I'm kind of surprised they didn't detect it. File share. Um, what, was, what was it using? The, the user's account? To yeah, I think it was brute forcing passwords too. Oh. Yeah.